Welcome to Paying Attention, a regular conversation between me, Peyton Bowman, and my friend, Nicholas Gruen. Uh, people will say, as if it's a, a kind of get out of jail card, they'll say, well, I'm not in favor of equality of outcome in which, say, everyone is paid the same amount of money, which probably is a dumb idea. I'm in favor of equality of opportunity. Mm -hmm. Well, everyone, how could you disagree with that? Right. Everyone likes that idea. To which the answer is, oh, so you're not in favor of equality of opportunity for people's children. Mm -hmm. <laughs> because the chances that a child has, uh, firstly, even if you pay people exactly the same amount of money, they won't have the same chances because some people have better parents or, or parents that are better suited to them than others. But but apart from that, if we're looking at a policy question like, you know, how progressive should the tax system be or should it be progressive at all, you can cook up some fancy concept like equality of opportunity, but then you have to take it seriously. If you really actually care about equality of opportunity, then take the damn idea seriously and admit that that will involve a lot of equality of outcome. You don't get to choose these things because the world doesn't, del you can't get your binoculars out and find equality of opportunity and say, we'll have that. Uh, yeah. The world is full of all these entangled uh, aspects. Yeah. Uh, and so don't tell us you're in favor of equality of opportunity. Give 1% of your time to that fact that that's a kind of a value or an idea that's in your head. And what the hell are you going to do down here? And how's it going to affect not just the people, but the people's children and their children and so on? And then you're starting to talk. I mean, that's the alt center, if you like. I don't know whether it's the alt right or the alt left, but <coughs> that's that's the part of the conversation that people just slip out of because it's so easy to it's so easy to invoke one of the gods. And back in Dante's time, that's God and Jesus Christ and the Holy Spirit, and here it's justice, dignity, uh, black lives matter, if you like, and all the rest of it. Um, and that's not what that's not what we should ask ourselves. We should be asking ourselves, what can we do? Yeah. So I, I mean, I think that just to unpack this argument about the equality of opportunity and 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 outcome a little bit. Because I do think that that's something that, that is, in a way, central to the debate around liberalism um, and, let's say, its, its critics. Yeah. So, and it's also, you know, it's, it's definitely, I, I see this defense, the use of this, you know, I, I believe in uh, equality of opportunity more, a little bit on the right side of the spectrum, I would say. But, yeah, that's right. So how does this, uh, so essentially to focus solely on this idea of opportunity, you are then putting, you know, let's say that, let's say the child of someone who has, who has failed to take advantage of the opportunities that were given to them, and then putting them in that, uh, if that same, they, they share in a way that, la that failure to take advantage of the opportunity that their parents um, were able to, you know, fail at yeah. doing, right? So, I mean, I do think there's, there's ways in which, you know, I think a good example of this might be um, <clears throat> in the U.S., one, one attempt to address something like this would be something like giving children health insurance, right? Giving children uh, publicly funded health insurance. Yeah. And uh, that, that, was, <laughs> that was a little controversial for America in some ways, but, um, but how would that, a policy like that, in, you know, in your way of looking at, the world as a kind of alt centrist how would a policy like that sort of fit in i mean it's it's sort of practical right make sure the kids can go to the dentist two big thumbs yeah. up two big yeah. thumbs up um in fact i'd go much further than that i mean i shouldn't speak too confidently about the american situation but how dare anyone tell us that they're in favor of equality of opportunity and not uh vote that the community should provide health insurance for children. How dare they? Sh wash their mouths out. Tell us the truth. You're not in favor of, you're not even in favor of trying. So, but that's an excellent example uh, of 
uh, let's just see the colour of your money. Just forget about the... Okay, you've told us you're in favour of equality of opportunity. Now fill us in. Why wouldn't you at least do that? Uh, well, do the Republicans or even the Democrats, uh, you know, just charging in that direction? Well, actually, they're not. Um, they've got funds to raise from the health insurance industry and the lobbyists and so on. I'm not speaking too moralistically about that. That's the game they're in. It's a dirty, dirty game <laughs> that that we set up, that we all we're all complicit in, and we call it democracy as we know it. And as you know, Peyton, I have some I have some ways of, d of doing a bit of tweaking with that democracy. But but uh, yeah, perfect. A, a perfect example. If we were serious, if we were serious, we would do that because that idea, which I hadn't thought of when I when I was talking about equality of opportunity, that is actually very well calibrated to that question. Mm. Uh, and that actually raises another uh, one, uh, another idea of mine, which I know I've spoken to you about, which is the hack. <laughs> so the hack is a borrowing from the language of coders, the language of hackers, where someone might say, look, I've hacked up a program and it will enable me to uh, copy uh, it'll enable me to copy an email to a thousand people out of my address book. Uh, I've hacked it up. Now, what that's saying is that there is, uh, I've put together a whole lot of features of the world in such a way that I brought about a particular result. And my idea of the policy hack is that there are lots of critiques of the existing state of affairs um, which don't necessarily lead one to any immediate conclusions about what you should do with those critiques. And I'll give you an example. So George Stigler from the University of Chicago, a, a Chicago, you know, right, right wing or right of centre, libertar fairly libertarian, liberal economist, produced, worked up a theory and a lot of empirical um, support for what is now known as regulatory capture. So he showed that if you reg if you set up a public monopoly and then you regulate its prices or in fact a private uh, monopoly or a private market and you regulate its prices, then by a, uh, well, by a process he wasn't too clear about, the regulators end up largely, um, largely depending on the information that's provided to them by the regulated entities they're the experts, they're the people who actually have the information, and so they get captured. And he was able to show that in many ways regulation imp increased their returns, didn't reduce their returns. And that also explained why many utilities were rather in favour <laughs> of this regulatory arrangement. Now, all that is is a critique. It doesn't tell you good we're in a world of monopoly, let's just throw away regulation. It leaves you in a dilemma. It says this thing that you put your faith in, you should put much less faith in. Okay, now that's a very important piece of work that he did. Now we've got to work in dilemma space. Now consider that, and now consider the difference between that and Ronald Coase, who came up with an analysis, a, a sort of a, uh, a counterintuitive analysis of pollution. And he said, well, rather than thinking about pollution as a kind of a bad act that we punish the bad actors into doing the right thing, another way to think about it would be to say that um, the problem is just that it's a problem. Uh, well, he, he, he argued it. It was a sort of a thought experiment, I think, to a substantial extent. And he said, well, if there was, uh, if the owner of the factory also owned the the land and the factories and the well, then you've got the lives. We'll forget about them for a moment. Also owned, had ownership, an ownership stake in all the damage they were doing, then they wouldn't pollute, and you would have internalised the problem. And and that's a 
again, that's an interesting and a useful bit of a thought experiment, but it leads directly to a hack. And that hack is tradable permits. That hack is to say, right, well, we're now going to say that you've been emitting uh, 500 tonnes of this junk every year. You now get the right to emit it or you have to pay for the right to emit it and we're going to lower it down and down. Or, we, or you just pay these other people. You know, it, it gives you a whole lot of flexibility yeah. to... Yeah. And so you're taking an idea and the idea translates directly into a hack and everyone's happy. In other words, you've taken the idea, a bit like you took the idea of a quality of opportunity and said, well, that wouldn't that mean health insurance for mm. kids? To which I think the answer is absolutely yes. Um, so again, this is what we should be talking much more about what we're going to do, what can be done, what remains highly difficult, you know, just extremely difficult. Um, and we don't, we don't, because it's not a good way to deliver a speech. It's not a good tweet to say it's complicated. Um, so politics takes place both at the very highest levels in the academy and in political operatives, in the mainstream, in mainstream political parties and on Twitter. Um, it's all in this area which James Burnham said was nine-tenths what people do when they talk about politics, which is kind of wish mm. fulfilment and the, and the in, indulging ourselves in transcendental abstractions. So th this is a term that has come up a few times, and I think we could talk a little bit more about it, but this idea of wish fulfilment, right? So um, I think that yeah. certainly in this case rather than, let's say, wishing that a factory would just stop emitting uh, pollution because I, I want to tell them to just stop, <laughs> and then they stop, and no, there are no con negative Yeah, that's right, that's right. right. So, the wish fulfillment, the, so, so the wish fulfillment would be a speech to an audience which says no factory should be allowed to despoil our yeah. environment. Whereas in the reality is a bit different. The reality is, well, we get we need factories, so we're going to have to try and work yeah. out well, what I to think, do. Yeah, there was Sorry, something. You go on. Also, go on. recently, uh, Biden tweeted that he, or so, I don't know if he tweeted it or he said it, but that the the oil companies should not be greedy and they should lower their profit margins or something like this, ignoring the fact that that's that's yeah. not really how prices are set in the market and it, it's a very sort of, yeah. So, yeah, 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 yeah. Very much yeah. A, a kind of well, it's obviously not. Um, I mean, I assume it wasn't said 100% in good faith. He's trying to shift the blame for high oil prices to, to anyone um, that he can. But yeah. so, and, and you can, yeah, and you can argue that in just as an economic point, you can argue that in that particular un, unusual circumstance, it's actually quite efficient to introduce a, a sort of short-term yeah. rationing and and order people around rather a lot in a situation like that but we'll sure, leave that sure. to well, one side. certainly short term i mean anything short term is in a sense by nature a kind of hack too as well so i think it um but yeah so so anyway this idea of wish fulfillment and in what what does it um i mean what does it essentially come down to when you know, if we, we if we treat politics completely as a sort of sense of wish fulfill, fulfillment, you know, what does that say about, let's say, the community or about the people in it? You know, in other words, if I say, well, I want there to be world peace. And I assume by, yeah. you know, maybe we repeat this enough times. I do. I do too. I do. Yeah, I do too, course. by the way. We, we always yeah. want, you know, and so... Let's say we all want this. If we just say it enough times, if we just do, you know, we, we try to be nice enough to each other. Um, it, that yep. method by itself assumes, in a sense, that there's a certain uh, way in which the human community could be construed as, as being ultimately good in some sense, and working towards its own positive ends. And then I think, you know, if you critique politics as saying <clears throat> that. We are not, um, you know, if you if you critique this approach, 
saying that, well, we can't have wish fulfillment in politics. What are we saying about... Well, well hang on, hang on, hang on. Uh, let me say that the point about wish fulfillment is a point about the language in which politics okay. is done. Um, the way it, it, it's not... Or, or politics, in a sense, should be about wish fulfillment. It should be about different people coming to... Uh, assembling in their collective capacity and saying we should do this we should invade iraq or we should certainly not invade iraq we should give more money to the poor we should so so, so it's about wish fulfillment it's about trying to build the world yeah. that we want uh it's going to build a better world and then a conservative could say well uh, that's a big mistake to try and build a better world. It's trying to. It's 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 got to be a lot about maintaining order and maintaining what we have, and that's that's okay. That's what we. Sh that's again a kind of an ought. That's yeah. a kind of a wish. So everyone comes to politics with their wishes. The problem is they sort of leave politics with their wishes and they engage in political debate in terms of alternative wishes rather than the task of weighing the wishes, weighing the means and the ends by which we try to realize those wishes work and, and then move to, to a, 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 I was gonna say healthier, but certainly move mm. to a healthy future. So it's not saying we shouldn't worry about our wishes. It's saying we shouldn't imagine that, that asserting a wish mm -hmm. is to achieve a wish. In fact, something which lots of critics of of corporate planning mm. badly done is say if you look at what these corporate goals are yeah. they're a bunch of wishes they're not uh, they're not uh, carefully thought out statements about how yeah. you're going to do stuff yeah i think that uh, i kind of wanted to bring that up because i think that one p potential way in so which someone could misinterpret this idea is to say that well people just have these these kind of dreams and there's no way to achieve them. What, what you yeah, need is some sort of like ignore. autocratic, yeah. you know, technocrat who can sort of figure out how to solve the problems. And that's not what you're saying, right? That's exactly not what I'm saying. And nor and, and one of the things that I've also been misunderstood to be saying in Burnham particular, really just by quoting the Burnham, is by is to say uh, people in fact the the blog post was about this. Uh, to, to a substantial extent, people say, oh, well, you're very pessimistic about human beings. You don't want there to be, uh, you know, you don't want politics to be about fulfilling our wishes for the future. Yeah. And that isn't the case. Uh, I, I do want it to be about that. I want it to be uh, about that very, very <laughs> desperately uh, in a way that is not alienated, uh, in a way in which the connection between the wishes and the world we live in is the is of the essence of the discussion and it just is it just is so often not the case uh and when you were a, a little earlier you were talking about um well i don't know whether you were talking about i think you were but it would conjure up in my mind the idea of politics and community and of course as an american a part of the bedrock of American political thinking, Tocqueville is there as uh, this Frenchman who traveled around the United States in the 1830s, writing up what American, American democracy was becoming at the same time as being rather anxious about certain things. And he was saying that um, he was marveling in the capacity for communities to come together and to, um, to, uh, constitute themselves in their collective existence in a town hall meeting and 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 work out how to build a better world um and at that scale you are able to you, you at that scale there's more disciplines on people not to just use nice words because this person who's speaking uh we know that last week they really should have brought their grandmother some food, but they didn't. Um, so how dare they talk about building a better world and our duties to each other? In other words, 
Um, and, and so politics at a more local level is, is, has, has to attend more to the fabric of life in term, uh, to, to this relationship between our political aspirations, our social aspirations, our wishes, and the way people are behaving. And you don't have to do that in, in mass media-based politics. It's totally absent. You have a publicist, you, you know, get lots of nice shots taken of you when you go to some social function and or you might want to go and shake the hands of some some refugees or you, you craft an image. Uh, and we don't, you know, we, we have to use our skills such as they are. Many of us don't have them, you know, those of us with the best of those skills, they're not very powerful um, to read between the lines and work out whether this person's for real or not. Um, so, so this whole tacit layer, this layer of life is just folded away from all these words that we use. Uh, and of course, this is a, has always been a big problem. And as then the bigger democracy gets, the more, in, the more intermediated it, it is by mass media in which I include social media. Um, uh, certainly amped up social media, uh, maximally interconnected social media, the more it's down to the words and his, the, the connection with the fabric of lives is, is just not there. Yeah, I'm reminded a little bit of some of these movements of civil disobedience, right? So in some ways, the American civil rights movement started not, not with some, you know, yeah. there, there are obviously a lot of sources to this, but it, it kind of started with a bus boycott. Right. You know, what, what does riding the bus have to yeah. do with being, you know, the grand idea of everyone being equal and having rights? And, or yeah. even with Gandhi, exactly. you know, his, his yeah. starting point was just let people pick up salt off the beach so that they can they can use it. You know, it's, it's just sit lying there on the beach. Let poor people just take the salt and use it. Right. And it was in that particular very yeah. specific, very limited goal that that had that larger aim kind of encapsulated that that would would go towards. Well, well, well. Can I, can I yeah. maybe just interpolate here? In many ways, those two examples that you use yeah, are yeah. political hacks. So what they're doing is they're engineering a collision between the life world and the and the ideas and the the rules and the legislation and so on, and they're trapping the rulers in a massive dilemma because they're trapping the rulers in something which is exposing the contradictions of what it is they're doing and the unfairness of what it is they're doing and so on. And that, again, is, you know, it's a good example because I, I think a lot of left of centre activism um, spins its wheels uh, in fact, it enables me to now. Now, you may want to have finished your question, or you may be happy with well, me I'm, I'm, yeah, charging that, off and making. Yeah, I'm interested to hear what you have to say next. Yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. So, think of wokedom. Um, wokedom involves, and now wokedom, you know, certainly in its more mild forms and its more more its earlier forms is very important. It's very important to try and build into. Um, our public discourse and basic respect. But today, um, there are just huge contradictions involved in wokedom. And one of the things that wokedom does is that it co it, it, allow, it, it, um, it co opts an upper layer of a, so, of, a, of, of a victim class, if you like, people of color people of colour, you get to Harvard and so on, and then you find that you're a beneficiary of all kinds of, of benefits. Now, let's just take an example, uh, just a concrete example in Australia of a person I know of, I don't know the, per I, I know the example, I don't know the person, and they are 1 16th Aboriginal. Uh, now, they are benefit that they've been to private schools their whole lives and they benefit from uh, various programs now i don't i haven't you know good luck to them 
but they're benefiting because they can be advanced with the least possible discomfort for the powers that be. They still get themselves a private school educated person who's done well at uni and who's basically upper middle class. Yeah. What kind of diversity is that? So, so, uh, so we spin out, so, so we create these, I don't know, I'd call them sort of vectors of impatience, if you like. The, we reify, that is to make two, uh, we reify ideas, we take these abstract ideas, uh, and one of them is whether you are indigenous or not, and we're not going to go anywhere near that. We're not going to wrestle with the with the with the desperately difficult dilemmas that throws up. And and this happens also in gender politics because we just go we just back right off and say, oh well, it's whatever people choose. Well, most of the time that's fine, and some of the time it's not fine. Uh, if 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 I want to call myself a man and go into sport and uh, sorry a woman. <laughs> And uh, and go and uh, you know hop into UFC or so on. Well, I'll lose anyway because I'm too old and too scrawny. But you get the point. Um, so so we so we live our as so increasingly politics uh, heads off into these this world of abstract ideas and that which are then kind of weaponized further down yeah. rather than engaged with. Um, and it's madness. It's just a terrible state of affairs. Yeah. Well, I, I think that the example of of kind of being woke is is interesting in the sense that I do think that I, I think we spoke a little bit before about about this one one thing I saw on TV where this woman was giving a speech in one of these school board meetings, and these are I don't know if you see a lot of these in Australian media, but it's kind of the, the school board meeting is now a major point of conflict with parents coming to protest in these American public school systems. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I've, I, I definitely do. I've seen some of this stuff and I was just reading a couple of, somebody rang me up from San Francisco. So a friend of mine uh, contacted me because he was part of the, he, he's a school teacher in San Francisco and he was, uh, you know, he saw this thing, which I you probably know about. Uh, it was the renaming 44 schools in the San Francisco district. It became a national issue. Uh, and he was talking about how this could be depoliticized. And we were talking about. Yeah, yeah. And things. Well, but anyway, I, I you, think that's you, what, you know, yeah. watching one of these. I was watching this teacher give a speech and I thought. I could kind of see the point she was going for, but but by using this language of of uh, this is very abstract language to talk about race relations. I felt that it was very, yeah. you know, if you were on the outside of that discourse, it's very, very alienated, alienating, and it's not at all attempting to build a bridge. Yes, totally. And so this woman actually turned out to be a Latin teacher. That's right. I used to be a Latin teacher, so I was very interested. And I, I looked at what she, her, she had a very active Twitter feed and I looked at it and I could tell by reading the Twitter feed that, this is a good teacher. This woman really cares about her kids and the stuff she was doing in her classroom were, yeah, like, these, yeah. were like these hacks. So, that's right. um, and I, I, I thought it was great. Yeah. I mean, up to a point, I, I mean, I, I have, I would certainly have an interesting conversation with this person, but I, I thought she was great. I thought what she was doing in the classroom was great. You know, like one, one thing, for example, she was doing <clears throat> is that there's a textbook, which I used called the, the Cambridge Latin, uh, I think it was Cambridge Latin, course and you know in the first book of this textbook which is the one you read when you're the youngest there is this depiction of a, a roman household with slaves and the slaves have a very you know good relationship with their masters right and well there's one kind of good slave and one kind of bad slave and so yes yeah, certainly that this kind of discourse even though all the slave none of the slaves were african or anything like this and it was this pre-modern slavery, and and Romans were definitely uh, slaveholders. All that was accurate. Oh, I see. And but, then, but, and but, then but, away we go. But, then it turns know, into and, a and complete... this textbook. The, the yeah. narrative of the textbook is based on, I think, Roman comedy. You know, that's the source material. But but you know, it's fair if you're teaching, yeah. let's say, kids in a school, 
especially in maybe in a more Southern school and people are conscious of these narratives. Oh, oh, slaves were all happy when they were living, you know, in the plantations pre before the war. And you hear this kind of thing when you, you know, I heard it when I was growing up yeah. and I don't think it's true. And I, I mean, yeah. at least I can't imagine it's, it was everyone's experience that this was a great situation and you might not want to teach that in your classroom. So yeah. she changed this words is servus, which means slave to, Amicus, which is friend, and that has a, a different, it has the same grammatical uh, kind of features. It, it has the same sort of um, declension, same ending. So, you know, in terms of teaching the material, um, that was pretty good. Yeah. And I thought that's a pretty good solution. I mean, it would it be better to rewrite the textbook and to address some of these issues a bit more head on. But I thought that was great. I thought that was a really nice solution to yeah. the problem. And, and it was very practical, very much yeah. a hack. You know, she... And, and let me and let me just interrupt that your it matters all of that background knowledge which I'd so call in some sort of sense tacit knowledge all that matters because you could do this hack and just yeah, think yeah. oh yuck she shouldn't have done that it, it's why you're doing it it's what you're going to make of doing it and it's accepting that whatever you do, it's not going to be perfect because yeah. we're not up here at the transcendental level. She we're down yeah. here. She recognized she wasn't going to be able to go to the go Cambridge on. University Press and, and p pitch this new version of the textbook. Probably they need to do that at some point. But, you know, the, the speed at which that would happen is not fast enough. And she wanted to. Well, I'm not sure. We could have a separate discussion about that. I feel pretty strongly about the the, you know, kind of confronting people with the tr with the truth um yeah. rather than dressing it up and there are but there are lots of you know there are lots of different situations and lots of different circumstances and i'm not trying to argue that is some i'm not trying to argue that that's some general you know all one size fits all principle that is always uh, always to be applied but um yeah i think that it's it's definitely interesting to to see how that debate can operate on these different levels but at the end of the day, you've got to do something. You know, you don't want to just sit there and saying, "Ah, sustainability is great," or this, you know. Well, uh, and then there's the then there's the flip side of this. So I was involved in a day of interviewing students at Monash University, which is one of Australia's better universities in located in Melbourne, and. Um, one of its leading universities, probably one of the, the top four or five in the country. And in order to interview people, I had to sign a statement. And the statement said that during the interview, the following protected attributes must not be discussed. Those attributes are age, breastfeeding, career status, disability, employment activity, gender identity, industrial activity, lawful sexual activity, marital status, parental status, personal association, physical features, political belief of activity, pregnancy or potential pregnancy, race, religious belief or activity, sex, sexual harassment and sexual orientation. Now, I signed that partly for, 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 uh, uh, that there are big because, uh, well, I'll, I'll, uh, the, the, that's a long story, uh, but hmm. it just totally outrages me because if we care about those things, we might want to discuss them. Um, and, and so the, the administration who imposed that rule are not, I mean, they will, of course, be out there saying how much they're doing the right thing with regard to all these things. But that's not their purpose here. Their purpose here is if this does some harm, hmm. well, too bad. It protects the institution. So yeah. that's the... Uh, so so this is something else that is going on which is that everyone's looking after their own patch and in fact this is why wokeism is as successful as it is mm. because it's actually targeting people like this it's mm. actually generating results and those results are put up as a big tick for the woke activists but i don't think they're a big tick i don't think defunding the police is something that black communities in America uh, who are, you know, who are trying to earn money at jobs and do all those things. I don't think they think what we really need is do and, and who are 
set up, you know, in in which there, there is there is plenty of drug addiction and crime around the place. I don't think they're thinking, well, we need to defund the police. That isn't one of the things they think is really going to deal with our issues. Um, so, so it's a kind of grand. It, it, it's it's this wish fulfillment. It's this abstraction taken to a grand passion, and also via a kind of hack or a negative hack, it happens to work. It happens to be the sort of thing you can motivate people with on Twitter, and you can terrify <laughs> administrations, who are both of universities and and um, not for profit outfits and of large corporations who are trying to keep everyone happy and stop people boycotting their products and so on. Um, and it's not about trying to engage with um, difference. It's the, it's the refusal to engage with difference. That's the, the, <laughs> that's the remarkable thing. It's, the, it's something like it's, it's a sort of shadow of engaging with difference, something like it's opposite. Well, I think that's a, it's an interesting note, and I think we should uh, we can end on that one. But um... yeah, it sounds it sounds quite good because that's um, it's a nice conclusion to have reached, and then you come back to the idea that this is what's alt about it. It's try it it says just like the right, we see through the bankruptcy of this particular course that we've started going down yeah. well very interesting well thank you very much nicholas and uh yeah i look forward to our next conversation all right thanks Peyton. <laughs>